Welcome to video recording for a lecture in the course CIVI 5108 Performance-Based Earthquake Engineering at Carleton University. This lecture is going to be on materials elements and transformations in nonlinear modeling um, with specific application to the software package OpenSeas, it's the earthquake engineering uh, research uh, modeling package that we use for nonlinear um, time history analysis. So when we talk about nonlinearity in models, there's two primarily uh, two primary types of nonlinearity that we generally want to consider. One is the kind of more obvious material nonlinearity. This includes yielding of elements, like yielding of beams, columns, yielding of um, uh, uh, diagonal bracing, uh, friction slip or friction, other kinds of friction between elements in a model. Um, damage, which is also related to yielding, but could also relate to brittle damage, uh, which would cause uh, material properties to change significantly. And um, also cyclic stiffness and strength degradation are things that we might want to take into account when we're talking about material nonlinearity. The other type of nonlinearity that we're interested in is geometric nonlinearity. And this relates to um, the positions of all the nodes in our model. So if we have a model we have initial placement of all our nodes. Um, the geometry of the structure at the beginning of our uh, analysis is basically set based on the locations of our nodes. Now when we continue to step through the analysis, um, if we do a regular linear analysis, then the position of the nodes, the relative locations of all of the parts of the structure will not change when the uh, computer goes to calculate stiffnesses. Um, but in reality, um, all our, our structure may change position over time. Now, you, you, know, you might ask, well, I mean, obviously, even in a linear analysis, our structure can change position. Yes, but this is the difference between um, each node having a parameter called displacement that is calculated using um, stiffnesses and forces and the actual positions of the nodes changing based on that displacement. So to calculate displacements in a linear model, we don't have to change the locations of nodes or consider that the nodes have actually moved. Um, but in a, in a geometrically nonlinear model, that's one step further, which allows us to consider that the locations of nodes have changed. And why does that affect things? Because, well, if we have uh, two nodes, for example, and one of them moves, and we have a vertical load on one of the nodes that's moved, then now that vertical load might create a moment, right, which is called the P-delta effect, which we're going to talk about in more detail later in the uh, lecture. So in order to consider P-delta effects, which of course are very important for building models, or consider large displacement effects, which are um, uh, similarly important in a lot of cases, which is kind of the general term for um, geometric nonlinearity, um, we need to have a way to explicitly that consider that in the way that we model our structures. <clears throat> so in OpenSea specifically, this is the way that all of the pieces fit together. When we're talking specifically about nonlinearity, um, we have kind of the model on the left of the slide. So the model is built up in a way where we first define materials. Let me get the pointer. Uh, we first define materials then those materials will go into our elements. So if we have a steel material and then we make a steel beam, then the steel material will be used in a steel beam and that beam is an element. Um, optionally, between those locations, I might have sections, which we're going to talk about uh, later on in this, um, in this lecture. And then once I have all my elements set up and the locations of those elements set and the connectivity of the elements set, and also by extension, the stiffness of all the elements set, including the material, that the element is made of, then the model communicates with the OpenSea solver in order to determine what is the status of the model at each time step. How much has the model displaced? What are the revised forces if the forces need to be changed? Um, what is the current stiffness, et cetera, et cetera. So the nonlinearity comes into play in two places. We have the material nonlinearity that we were talking about. That comes into play when we define our material model. So when we use a steel model, we have all sorts of different options for 
uh, nonlinear steel models that we can use in OpenSeas. We define the nonlinear behavior of the steel material and input it into the material model. So the material model knows how to behave. Um, and then that obviously progresses through into elements and then gets solved. It might not be the case that we're talking about a, a material, uh, you know, the material might not actually be like steel or concrete. A material model can also represent um, a hysteretic behavior of an entire element. Like for example, I could define a material model and it's called a material model that represents the moment rotation relationship for a certain plastic hinge. Um, so it doesn't have to be at the material level per se, but material model is generally the way that we define nonlinear behaviors, at least material type nonlinear behaviors, ductility type nonlinear behaviors in open seas. Then the geometric nonlinearity comes through an intermediate step, which is a geometric transformation. So for each element in our model, we have to define a certain type of transformation. And the transformation handles how does, um, um, how does the stiffness of the model change at every step based on uh, position of the nodes. So if the uh, element moves, or if we have P delta and the, the node at the top of an element moves to the left and there's a load on that element, the geometric transformation will determine how the revised stiffnesses get calculated um, to account for that. And um, the geometric nonlinearity comes into play in that geometric transformation. So most elements require us to define what kind of geometric transformation we're using. Are we using a linear geometric transformation, P delta geometric transformation, full large displacement nonlinearity geometric transformation, and um, then OpenSeas takes care of the rest. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, material model, as I mentioned before, we could either be defining an, ex an you know, a constitutive relationship like a, actually a material, like a steel constitutive relationship. How does the stress relate to strain? Um, right. So here on the right side, we have constitutive relationships. This is a, uh, you know, this is like a, a uniaxial, single degree, constitutive relationship. And here's the same thing just in a matrix form for, um, you know, if I have multiple um, um, ways that the element can move, right? So if I'm talking about uh, isotropic in multiple directions or orthotropic or anisotropic material constitutive relationships, then I can define that here. So this just defines how the stress is related to the strain. And of course, you know, like if we're talking about linear relationship, then these are usually constants, right? So if I'm talking about steel before it yields, then, you know, I know that E is 200,000 MPa and it remains that all the time. Um, but uh, since we're talking about nonlinearity here, then we're talking about situations really where the E, the stiffness, the material stiffness, the Young's modulus changes uh, over time, depending on what's happening in our model, how much it has deformed, et cetera, et cetera. And so that can be a uniaxial like E here, or it could be multiaxial uh, like the constitutive matrix C here. Um, so I can do that at a material level, or I can define material models at a larger scale, like as I said, as a moment rotation relationship, or as an axial force deformation relationship, where I'm talking about force and deformation instead of stress and strain, right? So if I have a, a, an axial cross brace in my building, instead of defining the material property of the steel and then trying to figure out you know, making a fiber model of the cross section or something like that, which we'll talk about later, I could just define the overall force displacement relationship, force deformation relationship. So then my material model is basically me defining what K is and how K behaves um, nonlinearly depending on how the uh, element deforms. And so I could do that the same for moment rotation. So if I wanna define how a plastic hinge behaves at the end of a beam, then I can define explicitly the moment rotation relationship and that defines the stiffness at all times. Um, so which one I'm using here depends on the context of how I'm using that material. So I define my material, I give it, uh, I have to give it appropriate units. Um, and if I use my material inside a fiber element, for example, where I have multiple fibers and each fiber is representing one little bit of the uh, 
cross-section, then I would be defining it in terms of stress and strain. So I would be using this one at the top. If I'm defining an overall behavior, like I'm defining a brace and I'm putting my material directly into a truss element, for example, or directly into a plastic hinge for uh, at the end of the beam, then the, when I define my material model, I'm going to define it in terms of you know, rotation versus moment in kilonewton millimeters or whatever the appropriate units happen to be. <clears throat> so for example, um, you know, most of the materials that we're going to use are uniaxial materials, uh, typically, although we can also do, you know, what they call ND, which is like multi-dimensional materials, which we'll uh, also talk about. Um, but that would be for uh, elements that are 2D elements, like um, um, plain stress elements or, uh, you know, even 3D elements. They have those things in open seas. But for building modeling, uh, you know, typically if we're doing stick modeling with beams and columns and stuff like that, uniaxial materials are most of the things that we will use. So a uniaxial material just de defines basically a one-dimensional stress-strain relationship or a force deformation relationship, you know, also could be, of course, a moment rotation relationship. And the units for this relationship, again, depend on the context. So if I'm defining a stress-strain relationship for use in a fiber, then my stiffness is going to be in MPA, right? It's going to be in like the same, um, the same as uh, same units as as Young's modulus, right? So that means my stress would be in units of stress MPA. My strain would be in the units of strain, right? Which is unitless. If I was defining a uniaxial material for use in a fiber, now if I'm using the same type of uniaxial material, and I intend to use it for um, a, a, a section bending, like a plastic hinge, at a specific, for a specific degree of freedom, so let's say rotation at the end of the beam, then I would be defining it in terms of moment and curvature, right? And here I would use curvature, why? Because that section has a specific finite length and the curvature gets translated into rotation then, because the rotation is the curvature times the length of the hinge, basically. If I'm doing axial force versus um, axial force versus strain, if I'm using a, a uniaxial section, uh, axial DOF, like I have a, um, a beam and I'm doing an axial DOF, then my, uh, my units might be in terms of axial force, kilonewtons, strain, unitless, right? Um, if I have a discrete rotational spring, so the spring is only in one location, therefore it has no length, it is discrete spring, then my units will be in terms of moment and rotation. Um, if I have a spring that represents a diagonal brace, or uh, uh, yeah, a diagonal brace basically, then I would be doing, and it was a single discrete spring element, then I would use force and deformation. So you see, you have to be careful when you define these materials, that you have the right units, and that you're, you're using it in the right context, like you're getting out of that material what you intend to get. And actually, that's, um, that's a good reason to use the uh, material test uh, script that I wrote and posted on our course website. Um, so if you use that material test uh, script, then you can, whatever material you're using, you can plug in all of the parameters that you intend to use into that material test script, and then it will output for you what the output looks like. And then you can look at the units of that output and make sure it makes sense. And then, of course, always building small models first, models of an individual interface or an individual brace and then testing those using a small open seas or a, you know open seas model in order to make sure that uh, the element is behaving the way that you intend it to because it's easy to mix things up especially at this step when I'm defining materials and I need to make sure that I'm putting them in in the right units and it's not even units it's context like am I defining a stress or am I defining a force or am I defining a moment those things are all obviously very different Okay, so that's uniaxial materials. I mentioned we have ND materials, which means n-dimensional. So if I have a continuum element, 2D element, like a quad or a tri element or a 3D brick or something like that, there are ND materials in open seas. Um, one obvious uh, application for these would be if I have a, you know, in building earthquake analysis, would be I have a building sitting on a, a soil and I want to model the you know, some finite 
field of soil below the building, then I could use elements like this in order to do that. You know, if I wanted to model a dam or something like that, then ND elements are available, including nonlinear behavior of those elements in OpenSeas. Um, and then we have um, sections. And sections are a bit hard to explain without seeing it. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of um, explain it better later. But in some beam column elements, instead of defining specifically, you know, a moment rotation, you can't define a moment rotation for the entire beam. Um, you need to define discrete locations where uh, that moment rotation behavior will exist. And so that's the purpose of a section. So basically you define a section you know, you make that section um, either a fiber section or a regular moment rotations section or whatever, and then you put your material into the section and then you put your section into the beam instead of going directly from material to beam. For example, that's a common use of sections, which we will use. Okay, so what do these materials look like? You know, for example, here we have a, a simple uniaxial nonlinear material almost as simple as you can get. This is a steel, it's called steel 01 or steel 01. You know, it's called steel, but it's basically a general elastoplastic hysteresis. Why, what does that mean? Elastoplastic means basically I have an elastic portion here up to a yield and then past that yield, I have a plastic region and I can define a stiffness for that plastic region. And if I do a, a cyclic analysis on this, then it will come up and back, and we're going to see some examples of that in a minute. Okay, so it basically ends up looking like a parallelogram. And so you see here, for definition of steel 01, you have certain parameters that you need to define. So you need to define E0, which is uh, basically the Young's modulus. You need to define Fy, which is the yield strength. And you need to define this B, which is the post-yield stiffness ratio. So it's a what percentage of the initial stiffness is the post yield stiffness so you know for if we're actually modeling steel with this steel 01 then you know that might effectively be in the range of something like 2% 0 0.02 for example okay so then what do we use as our units of all of these things well again it depends on the context if i'm actually defining this steel 01 material to be um uh, used as a steel fiber, then my yield strength will be in MPA. It'll be, you know, 350 MPA or 400 MPA, depending on what kind of steel I'm talking about. If I, and my, in, my Young's modulus will be in terms of MPA as well. And my B, since it's a ratio, is always unitless, right? So since this is a ratio, it doesn't have any unit ever. Um, but what if I want to use this to represent the behavior of some kind of friction device or something like that? and um, I'm putting it in an axial spring. Then I might define my yield strength as being in kilonewtons. And then my E might be in terms of a stiffness. It might be kilonewtons per millimeter or something like that. So I have to be, again, careful. Okay, now there's some other parameters for steel 01. Okay, steel 01 has the same behavior, positive, negative. So we just define one FY and then tension and compression, it's the same. Um, this is a simple model in that it has very sharp stiffness transitions. So we have an initial stiffness, it transforms uh, immediately into a post yield stiffness. Of course, you know, like most materials don't behave ideally like this, but this is an easy one to calculate. It's efficient, it's fast, you know, so there's a lot of applications for uh, material models like this. And then it has a potential, uh, potential for a hardening. Okay, so hardening means that the yield envelope changes over time. So, you know, in steel, uh, we get strain hardening, right? So after we yield and then we continue to yield, we pass the yield plateau and then our material starts to harden. It gets stronger as the strain increases. And if we were to release the strength, the force, and add the force back again, it's not going to yield again until it exceeds the new hardened strength, right? Which is the way that steel hardening works, right? So that's why this is put in here as a steel O2 model because it has that option to model hardening. We're gonna talk a little bit more about hardening in a minute. Uh, you know, but in general, this is a very good, very reliable, very uh, robust elastoplastic hysteresis model. How do I put this actually in OpenSea? So if I wanna define this model, it's very easy. Uh, we're talking about OpenSea's Pi. 
So I use the command uniaxial material. I have to make sure to notice that this is a capital M here. Okay, and then uniaxial material is the command that I use to define new uniaxial materials of all different kinds. I give it first the name of the material in quotes, this material is steel 01. You can find all the available materials in the manual. And then I have to give it a unique tag. So material tag is an integer. And that integer is just something to ID that particular material when I want to refer to it later. So if I have multiple materials in my model, this might be material one. Another one, I will call that material two. Then later, when I want to use that material in a section or an element, I'm going to provide that section or element that same material tag to say, use material number one, use material number two. Okay, so this is a material tag, it's an integer, and you can define it to be whatever you want. They don't have to be consecutive in OpenSea. So this could be material number 1001 if you want, if that's a better way for you to keep track. Okay, then after that, in general, for uniaxial materials, will come all of the parameters in order. And if you look in the manual, it will tell you the order. And those parameters will be different for all of the different materials. So in this case, our parameters are FY, B, and E0, which is our Young's modulus, or, or our stiffness, if we're talking about force displacement, for example. And so we provide FY, we provide E0, and we provide B. And now throughout this uh, lecture, uh, I have co I've color-coded these because the blue ones are the ones that are necessary, that I have to include in order to define this material. And then the purple ones are the ones that are optional. So since this material has the option for hardening, I can define A1 to A4, which are hardening parameters, which we'll look at in a minute. And uh, if I do that, I will put them after here. If I do not want to provide them, um, then I just leave them out. Um, let's look at what this looks like in the manual. Okay, here's the OpenSeas manual for OpenSeas Pi. OpenSeas Pi, just Google OpenSeas Pi, you find this. And then so if I want to find how the, um, uh, how the individual elements work or materials, I can go to model commands here. I'll find uniaxial material commands. And then down here, I will see a list of all of the different uniaxial materials that I have available in OpenSeas. So if I come and click on Steel 01, which is the one that we were just looking at, you see it provides all these parameters. This is the type of number. Integer means integer. Float means a decimal number. Okay, because so I can have decimals there, but integer has to be a whole number integer. And then um, you'll see that after it says A1, A2, A3, A4, all of these are identified as optional, which means that you don't have to include them uh, in the definition. Okay, so back to the slides. If I want to look at what does this look like in practice. Okay, here are some example hysteretic behaviors for a steel O1 material in terms of stress and strain. Okay, so here I have the zero, zero point. Let me just get my laser pointer again. Here I have the zero, zero point right where it starts. And then this is given some cyclic behavior over time and you can see that it reaches a yield it yields, then it changes stiffness immediately, and then I have this lower horizontal stiffness. Once I start releasing the load, it comes back at the initial stiffness again until it exceeds the yield stiffness in the other direction. Now, depending on what type of hardening you have, the, um, the yield in the opposite direction will be a bit different. Okay, so here we have um, uh, isotropic hardening example, so intention. So basically, the first time that I exceed the yield point, okay, so here I, I exceed the yield point for the first time, that then I have uh, post yield stiffness, and I have deformation under that post yield stiffness, and whichever force I reach by the end of this point, once I come back again, this is the new yield that I need to exceed in order to yield the material again. So this is replicating a hardening effect as this yields again and the yield force increases up to here we consider it hardened so next time i come around i have to exceed that force before it's going to start yielding again etc etc okay uh, and that is called isotropic hardening and when you do isotropic hardening uh, 
Um, it basically means that the entire, you know, if you look at this in terms of like a, um, um, you know, this is often showed as like a surface of yielding. Okay, so um, this is for an element that is 3D. So I have a stress in the principle one direction, principle two direction, principle three direction, and I could have yielding in any of those directions. Okay, but if we're just looking at one degree, then if I go in this direction, once I exceed yield, then it pushes the yield surface out, which means it increases the yield strength. And isotropic hardening means it increases the strength basically in all three dimensions, in all three degrees. Okay, now that's, so that's isotropic hardening. So steel O1 can only do isotropic hardening. Steel O2 can also do a kinematic hardening. And what kinematic hardening does is as the yield force increases, so as I yield, okay, so here I go, I yield, and then I have some, uh, some strain hardening post yield, so I have a post yield stiffness and my yield goes up. It does not increase the yield force in the opposite direction. Oh, you can hardly see here, sorry, behind my head. It does not increase the yield force in the opposite direction. It keeps the total distance between the yield points equal. So it means that, you know, if this was previously 100 and 100, say, so let's say it was, uh, yield was 100 MPA in tension, 100 MPA in compression. If this goes up to 120, that means that the yield on the way back is gonna be 80. So the total distance remains the same. So that's kinematic, uh, kinematic hardening. We also call that the Bauschinger effect. Okay, uh, it's possible to use both of these hardening models together at the same time. So I can have a bit of isotropic hardening, which overall extends the size of the yield surface. Um, and then I could also add kinematic hardening, which pushes it in one direction once it yields, which decreases the yield force in the return direction. Okay, so here's a slightly more complicated model than Steel 01. This one is called Steel 02. This is also a very robust model. Um, so it's a similar uh, to Steel 01. That's right, that's a typo. So it's a similar to Steel 01, but with kinematic hardening as well. So it's not just limited to uh, isotropic hardening. All right, and so how does that um, manifest, we have some additional parameters. So we have the same kind of parameters before Fy, E, E naught, B, which is our post yield stiffness ratio. Um, we also have kinematic hardening parameters and um, um, these CR values, degree of strength reduction relative to the initial yield, which is usually you know given as a range between 0.9 and 0.925 and a degree of strength reduction relative to the yield branch, typically 0 0.15. Um, how do you define these? I mean, uh, what you can do if you're trying to model a specific uh, steel material behavior is you can plot the steel behavior and then you can uh, fiddle with these values until you match your anticipated steel behavior. So depending on this R not value, for example, it changes how tight the transition is between the initial yield and the post yield stiffness ratio. And you'll see that part of that, so part of that Bauschinger effect is that it uh, makes a more gradual transition between initial stiffness and post yield stiffness. And actually that's kind of a benefit, you know, especially relative to steel 01, because, um, you know, numerical models don't necessarily love uh, abrupt and immediate stiffness transitions because um, it makes it harder to find the next step and probably requires sometimes more iterations to find the next step. Mm -hmm. So sometimes gradual transitions like this can uh, make for slightly more stable models depending on the situation. So that's steel low two. This is, you know, this, this model is good for modeling steel, but it's also good for modeling, like for example, buckling restrained brace, an entire buckling restrained brace. I can model in steel low two, or it's good for simple modeling of, um, a plastic hinge in a beam or something like that. Steel O2 would, would be good to come up with a moment rotation history for that. So here's some other examples of changing these parameters. CR1 versus, uh, you know, 0 0.5 versus 0 0.95. You see the return branch changes a lot. Okay, so 
Uh, this allows us to get some kind of more realistic steel cyclic behaviors, like the one on the right is, is uh, you know, something that we might more typically see compared to the one on the left. Um, it means also that you have kind of like a higher initial strength on the first cycle, but then in future cycles we have this kind of rounding. Okay, and this is caused by kinematic hardening. Okay, here's another one. This is just another steel that we can use. This one is called reinforcing steel, and this one aims to actually model the yield plateau. So like, you know, when you have a, a single degree of freedom, like you take a steel coupon and you pull it, and you look at the stress strain, and you know you often see this yield plateau, and then you have the hardening branch. Um, so this, the application of this is supposed to be for uh, reinforcing steel bars. Um, it also includes hardening. It has the ability to model bar buckling with a bunch of different bar buckling models. You can do strength degradation with it. So it's a very um, uh, potentially complex model. There's a lot of optional, you see there's a lot of optional parameters that I can include here. This is for a certain type of bar buckling. So you know like when you have at the base of a column, for example, you're yielding and you have some kind of spalling of the concrete and the bars, the reinforcing bars get exposed and then they can actually buckle in compression, you can try to model that effect. So there's two different buckling um, behaviors here. There is uh, isotropic hardening, you know, there's all sorts of different parameters that you can include here. Um, I would warn you a bit, you know, like you can try to use this model, it might be good for the first part of the project. Um, it uses a true stress, true strain formulation internally instead of engineering stress, engineering strain, but it is a bit finicky and it could be a bit hard to get it working. So if you try to use this one, um, you know, that's great. But, um, you know, if you're having problems getting the model to run, a uh, good thing is to switch temporarily to a simpler steel model, like even just switching to steel 01 to see uh, if that fixes your problem, because sometimes this one can have stability issues if you haven't defined everything correctly. Um, this is what that effective bar buckling looks like. So you can see here, this is without the bar buckling, what this steel material can look like. You can see the curved effect of the um, kinematic hardening. And on the right side, you can see that in compression, uh, bar buckling limits the compression, right? Because after a certain load, the bar buckles. And so you can get this bar buckling behavior. You can also do um, cyclic degradation using certain parameters um, where over multiple cycles, the response degrades over time. Okay, what about concrete material models? I haven't really um, settled on, you know, what is the best, most reliable concrete model. This is another place where it's good to kind of experiment, um, use the material test script, you know, maybe before you build your model. Use the material test script to make sure that this looks like how you intend it to look. Um, concrete 01 is a, is a simple concrete model where you um, define basically the strain at maximum stress, you define the maximum stress, and you define an ultimate stress, ultimate strain. So it can make kind of a, a, a regular kind of concrete behavior, but in tension, this material has no strength, so it's compression only. Um, it's based on Kent, Spark, Kent Scott Park material model. Uh, you can see, you know, the definition is pretty simple. Um, uh, one thing that you probably want to consider in your own modeling is in, um, in, a, in a column, for example, um, you know, we have effective confinement. So we typically do want to consider the effect of confinement, right? Like what is co the rebar confinement, like the stirrup confinement of the inner concrete has the effect of increasing the strength and the strain capability of the concrete that's within the rebar hoops, right? As I'm, you know, as I'm sure you know from previous concrete courses. So that means that you can define one, if you're doing a fiber section, which is a common thing to do for a concrete column, for example, which you'll likely do for assignment part one, then um, you know you will likely want to make one concrete material with a certain um, maximum stress and a certain ultimate strain capacity uh, 
uh, that represents the behavior of confined concrete. And then for the cover, you probably have a different concrete model. Now, both of those concrete models could be concrete 01, just with different parameters, for example. Um, or you could use a concrete confinement specific concrete model. Um, the tricky part is defining the parameters. And you probably have to do a little bit of research to figure that part out. And there's, you know, there's plenty of concrete confinement models out there that can tell you, you know, for a certain concrete strength, how does it increase um, to account for rebar confinement? And it always depends on the geometry of the of the cross section, right? So this is a example stress strain, you know, hysteresis for concrete 01 with compression only, right? So you see it's kind of parabolic up to the peak, and then it has a uh, straight uh, linear degradation post peak. Um, concrete 02 is similar to concrete 01, but it does have a small, you know, you can uh, identify a tension strength. Okay, concrete obviously we know it has some tension strength, but it's quite small. And it has, uh, you can define this uh, linear um, tension um, uh, strength reduction post cracking basically this is concrete cracking um, there's also uh, you know concrete 07 is another similar one it's a Chang and Mander model uh, you can look up confinement the man you know there's a Mander model for confinement which is very common and popular you know probably one of the most um, uh, referenced papers in uh, history of structural engineering is you know a Mander uh, confinement model you can try that out if you like um, a lot of the problems that you'll run into with um, getting things to run properly will be model definition, material definition. Because if you don't define it correctly, or something's off, or it's off by a factor of a thousand and the thing is totally not working, or just try a different type of model, different type of material model. For most things, there's multiple different things, multiple different ways you can go. Multiple different steel models for materials that you can select, multiple different concrete models that you can select, which might depend on your circumstance. So don't be afraid to um, experiment to see what is uh, most appropriate for what you're doing. I should mention also that uh, these have an effective initial stiffness um, that's calculated based on the peak and the um, uh, peak strain here. And it's basically two times the secant strain to the peak. Okay, that's what this is here. Um, so that's what it would use when it does a modal analysis, for example. It would use that stiffness um, because uh, if we do a modal analysis then it only uses linear properties so that would be the initial stiffness that it would use okay this is an example of what this might look like so you don't see a lot in tension because of course the tension strength is a lot lower than the uh, compression strength but you can see that there's a little bit of tension in the concrete 2 model which is the dotted line okay concrete cm is also a chang and mander model just like a concrete 07 Okay, so, but this one allows you to define some um, parameters to define how it works for confinement, and it also has stiffness degradation built in. Um, so another potential good model for, um, for uh, confinement and everything. Um, so you can, again, look into the details of these models in the manual, and it will give you more information and probably also often reference whatever paper is related to the definition of this model. So here's an example of how that one works. You know, this is the tension side on the top right. So you can see how the tension behavior works in the blow up here. <clears throat> okay, now in the previous lecture, we discussed adaptive hinge models and how, um, how uh, those models behave um, to take into account uh, cyclic stiffness and strength degradation that is affected by the history of the loading, right? So you remember we have like backbones that come from, uh, that we could get, for example, from ASCE 41, but those aren't necessarily representative of the cyclic behavior. So this is the model that I was talking about is the adaptive hinge model. Uh, Ibarra, Media, Crawwinkler are the, the initial, um, they were the ones who formulated this type of model. Um, now, I don't actually remember if this is the correct material type, because as I mentioned last time, there are there is an old implementation of this model in OpenSeas and a new one. And I suspect actually that these names are for the old one. If you want to see 
how to use this type of model with adaptive uh, hinges in the context of a steel moment frame, look up the six story example on the course website, which has the full open seas example for a six story building. And I use an adaptive hinge model for that. Um, so you can see exactly, and that's I think the one that we're gonna use for the second um, um, uh, project, perhaps not. But anyway, so you can look up there and see how to actually use it and what the right material names are for those. So make sure to see the manual and be careful with your use of those. Okay, so what if I want a model like a viscous damper, for example? How do I do something like that? Well, there is uh, there are a couple of different viscous models. There is a straight viscous damping model. Okay. And, uh, you know, so if this is, this is not for Rayleigh damping, this is not for inherent damping, this is, I have an explicit viscous damping effect somewhere. Like I literally have a viscous damper, like an oil damper with a plunger and a, and a, and a rod that moves in and out and displaces the fluid on either side of the damper. Um, so I can model that material behavior, which again is a, a velocity proportional force, right? And we know that the, um, equation for that, you know, if you know anything about viscosity, is basically the force equals a damping constant times the velocity. So this is x dot, so this the first derivative of displacement, the velocity. Um, in general, that is for a linear viscous damper, which means that the force is linearly proportional to the velocity. So that's that gives us, if I look at the force displacement behavior of a damper like that, and I apply a sinusoid, sinusoidal load to that damper, then I will see this behavior, which is this straight, the ellipse, the inner element, the inner drawing here, the pure ellipse. That's the force displacement relationship. So when the displacement is maximum, that's when it has stopped moving and is starting to move in the other direction, which is why the force is zero. And when the displacement is zero, that's when the um, dis that's when the velocity is highest because it has gone to the maximum and then it's come through zero. And once it gets through zero, that's the highest velocity before it starts decelerating in the other direction. So when the displacement is zero, that's where the force is highest. So that makes sense. Now in general, we can also define nonlinear viscous dampers. And all that means is that the force is not linearly proportional to the viscous, the vis the, uh, sorry, the velocity but it is proportional to the velocity times a certain exponent. So if I use an exponent that's less than one, then it has an effect of kind of capping the force to a certain degree. Um, not exactly, but it does limit the force in some way. And that means we move away from a pure ellipse into a more kind of squared out ellipse or like a rounded rectangle is another way that you could put that, I guess. Um, in, uh, in reality, you know, it's much easier to build a nonlinear viscous damper than it is to build a linear viscous damper because all of these dampers will have kind of leakage at high velocities and that's kind of what causes this exponent. So, um, so it's common to have viscous dampers that are nonlinear. How do I define that? Same way any uniaxial material, I use the name of this material, which happens to be viscous. I give it a tag so that I can refer to that material later. I give it a unique integer tag. I define the C, which is the uh, uh, viscous damping coefficient. And then the alpha is the exponent. And if I just want linear viscous damping, then my alpha will be one. Now, be warned, of course, defining C properly is it's not super difficult, but it does take some care because you have to make sure to get the right units for C. Okay, so what does that look like if I, oh, sorry, this is, a, this is a different one. So I have viscous and then I have viscous damper. So you can see which one works better for you. They both do approximately the same thing. The difference with viscous damper is it allows you to put uh, stiffness in series. So why would that come up? If I have a viscous damper, then that viscous damper, it has a rod that has the plunger that goes in and out of the damper and it also has a connection to the frame. And so that rod and that connection, it has some axial stiffness. It's not infinite. You know, if I just do this, I'm basically assuming that those have infinite stiffness. 
Okay, but the stiffness is not really infinite, so I can define um, here an elastic stiffness that is in series with the main damper to replicate uh, you know, the effect of the rod and the connection and stuff like that. So you can see in the definition down here, it has K elastic. Um, otherwise, the behavior should be approximately the same, except, uh, you know, I'm not sure if this, this can be, um, uh, you know, there's some tolerance relationships here because calculating a viscous force in series with a spring force is actually pretty hard. Um, so it needs to do some iterations to figure out uh, what the output force of the damper actually is. But here we can see some examples. Here's a viscous damper with a stiffness of 300 kilonewtons per millimeter in series and a viscous damping coefficient of 280.3. And you can see there's an exponent here because um, if this is nonlinear viscous damping, then the unit of CD also gets changed. Um, if anyone, wants to do viscous damping and stuff, uh, let me know just so that I can give you the right information to figure out how to calculate C values for nonlinear exponents if you end up going with nonlinear exponents. It's not that hard, but, um, but there are a few equations that you would need to know in order to do that properly. But so you can see that these, are, uh, these have nonlinear exponents. So you can see kind of the rounded capping effects here. This is one that has a very nonlinear exponent uh, I think the alpha here should be basically 1%. And you can see it behaves pretty much like a um, elastic, perfectly plastic hysteresis. So I have no stiffness post yield, which is very interesting. So these are all the different ways that you can combine viscous dampers with stiffness. So on the left, we have just pure viscous damper linear, right? As I mentioned, it has an elliptical force displacement behavior, assuming that you're putting a sinusoid on it. Um, this is the damper in spring and series. This is what I was just talking about, which is the Maxwell model. You can see the effect of the, of the spring in series is to kind of uh, parallelogramize this uh, hysteresis a bit, which is what we saw over here to some degree. The other thing that you can have is a damper and a spring in parallel. So this is called a Kelvin model. And this represents viscoelasticity, which is totally different from a damper and spring in series. This is, I have now uh, a viscous damper and a spring that are parallel to each other, so they both contribute to the force. And this is, this is actually pretty easy to model because I can just model this with a damper and I can actually just model a spring and put that spring in series with the damper in my model. It's, it's very straightforward and I get this viscoelasticity. And there are um, uh, some, uh, you know, kind of more uh, modern earthquake protection devices that uh, utilize viscoelasticity, um, often through using a viscoelastic material. So there are some kind of rubber type materials that actually behave this way. They're like damping rubbers, right? So that means that, you know, there is the core backbone elasticity of this, right? So there is increased force, increased displacement. But on top of that, as the material in this case gets sheared, so you get a piece of um, this type of viscoelastic material, and as you shear it, um, the material also provides viscous damping. So it has like a, a viscosity to it. And then you get this um, viscoelastic effect, which can be very useful. And of course you can add a series um, spring onto that as well and parallelogramize this a little bit in some way. Okay, what about self-centering? Um, you know, some people have seen some self-centering stuff. I think there was some discussion of self-centering in one of the reading uh, videos from before, and some people were interested, certainly. And also, I think we had a question last week about, um, um, can you make your own uh, behaviors in OpenSeas? And the answer is yes, but you have to learn how to program C++ <laughs> in order to do that. Um, so this material is to represent self-centering braces. I bring this up because I wrote this material for OpenSeas a long time ago, 15 years ago or something like that. Um, and it allows you to represent a flag-shaped hysteresis, which is the behavior of a self-centering device. So I have an initial stiffness, a post-yield or activation stiffness. And then when I let go of the force, it instead of going down to zero and ending up with a residual strain or deformation after the force is removed has a mechanism to bring the 
displacement back to zero on every cycle. Um, these other outside hysteresis are if I exceed a certain value, then I uh, have the option to provide basically what's equivalent to a friction slip device in series, um, which relates to the topic of my PhD thesis, which is why I included this. But uh, this can totally just be used as a straight up self-centering device with these kind of inputs. And um, you know, if anyone is interested in pursuing something like that for their project, let me know and I can um, help to guide you further. But it is possible to make your own behaviors. Um, some other interesting ones that might come in handy are uh, things for forming gaps. Um, so if you have uh, interfaces that open and close, if you have rocking, if you have um, um, gaps in your structure, then you can um, model with some of these. So of course there is an option for just a straight up elastic um, material behavior where all you have to define is the stiffness. Okay, so that stiffness could be in terms of MPA, if we're using this in a stress strain context, or it could be a kilonewtons per millimeter kind of stiffness, if we're using it in a force deformation context. I can define an elastic material that has a different positive and negative stiffness. You know, it could be something useful, or I could um, come up with an elastic um, behavior that, it, that has a stiffness in compression, but no stiffness in tension whatsoever, right? So this would be like something that uh, when it um, is sitting on a surface, it has a stiffness, but as soon as it wants to lift off that surface, it has zero stiffness, right? So that's a possible um, application of that. I could also do the same kind of thing, but include a gap so that, um, for example, this one for tension, this is tension gap, which means uh, there will be no stiffness in tension up to a certain point, and then it's like the element reaches some limit, it hits some surface or something, and then all of a sudden it takes tension. So that's the gap element. And in addition to those, there are some materials which act as wrappers for the others. Um, I don't have a lot of experience using these, but you know, like for example, if I wanted to have a material that, uh, let's say I have a force controlled um, element that breaks at some point, and I don't want to actually model the full nonlinear behavior of it, but I do want to identify uh, when it fails, then I could apply, for example, a min-max. They have a min-max material. And so the min-max material would have an input parameter, which is another material. So you'd say, okay, I have this material, which represents uh, something, and then I'm going to min-max it, which means if it reaches this maximum point, then it should fail, and it should go to zero strength or something like that. Um, I can apply an initial stress or strain, like if I have a pre-stressed element or something like that. I did actually try this out recently, and it worked very well. So I can make an initial stress or strain in a material, like so I have some steel pre-stressing and I want to stress it um, before the uh, rest of the um, uh, before the rest of the analysis proceeds. Or if I want to uh, implement, you know, for example, fatigue behavior in a material, I can wrap one material in this fatigue material. Okay, what do ND materials look like? These are the um, you know multi-dimensional uh, materials. So these are for 2D or 3D elements, you know, triangular, quad brick I mentioned before. This is just an example of uh, a type of model that can be used to represent a concrete wall. Um, this is from a PhD of one of my uh, students who did do an analysis like this in OpenSeas. Um, we were doing uh, hybrid uh, simulation analyses and we were rep also representing what we had in the lab. And the way this works is using um, smeared reinforcement layers and concrete layers and putting them all together. So basically what you do is you have um, uh, uh, one layer of 2D elements, so there would be a mesh of elements, that one layer that represents cover concrete one layer that represents the horizontal rebar, one layer that represents the steel rebar, and these are called smeared because in this type of model I'm not representing every single bar individually, I'm representing the effect of all of the bars together. And then I would have a core, core concrete model, so this one might include confinement, like it might be uh, um, calibrated to take advantage of confinement, then I would have horizontal and vertical steel on the other side, and then the cover again, 
So this is one way that you can model concrete in a concrete wall in OpenSeas, among many. I mean, I could also model a concrete wall using a single beam column element and make a fiber section that represents the behavior of the wall and, and um, have each of the um, bars and stuff. But of course, that type of model would not well represent the shear behavior of the wall, for example. So it all depends on your application, you know, as we've talked about already quite a few times. Um, so this is taking that multi-layered element and, um, and discretizing it into quads to make the entire surface of the wall. <clears throat> okay, so then this is what that might look like for two different kinds of discretization. Uh, one on the left, which is a little bit coarser, one on the right, which is a little finer. And um, you can see that there's different regions to include the boundary elements in the wall, you know, like sometimes we have kind of concrete columns that are built into the ends of the wall in order to increase the ductility. Um, so we could model those um, differently in order to take advantage, of, to take into account um, their behavior and, you know, use the confined concrete instead of the unconfined concrete because in those regions we have stirrups within the wall, right? So um, this is just an example of an ND, um, an ND type of model that we have actually used in the past and that worked very well. Okay, so <clears throat> now that we've talked about materials, um, what about sections? Okay, so remember we have materials, we just talked about material nonlinearity, so I define the force displacement behavior of the material and then I input that into a material model or I, I define material models that include that material nonlinearity and then sometimes I will include those materials into sections, and sometimes I will include those materials directly into elements, depending on what kind of element I'm trying to use. So what does it mean that we have um, a section? You know, not all types of elements will have sections, but sections are very commonly found in beam column elements. Um, you know, beam columns, just elements that have bending and axial force um, on them. And you know, this is like one of the most common types of elements, of course, that we'll use in structural models. Um, so we can um, define um, a beam column element with concentrated plasticity. Um, we have seen this before in some of the readings. Okay, so we can have discrete plastic hinges right at the end um, that are either built into the beam or we can model uh, separate rotational springs in separate elements at the end of the beam. Uh, those would be concentrated plasticity. That just means that all of the plastic behavior is localized to specific single point at the end of each beam, at each end of the beam, sorry. Or we can have a distributed plasticity. I mean, on one end of that is full finite element analysis, which would be rare for our application to use for beams. You know, we just saw one example of using a application of that in walls, which makes maybe a bit more sense depending again on what your application is. But we can also have distributed plasticity in terms of um, a, a plastic hinge that now has a length. Okay, so instead of being at a specific point uh, in, a, in a real plastic hinge at the end of a beam, all the plastic behavior doesn't get localized just at one single point. It's actually spread over a certain region. Or we can do distributed plasticity in terms of defining fiber sections over the length of the beam or column that um, have the geometry and material properties baked into the sections. So um, those sections could be fiber sections, but they also could just be um, force displacement, moment rotation behavior. So I could define the moment rotation behavior of that beam, and I could have that located at multiple different sections along the beam. Um, and those would be like the integration points in the analysis that we're going to see later. Okay, so what kind of sections, you know, what kind of sections can we put here? It doesn't have to be a fiber section. I can have multiple different types of sections uh, that I define along the length of my beam. You know, like for example, I can just have a regular elastic section, which just means that I just provide it with E, A, and I. Right, so I'm talking about a beam section, so I need the Young's modulus, I need the area. Um, that gives me basically the axial stiffness, right? And I need also the I, which is the second moment area, which gives me the bending stiffness, right? I can optionally also provide the shear stiffness in terms of the shear modulus and a shape factor. Um, 
and um, this type of elastic element will take into account deformations from axial and bending and also potentially shear. But of course this has no nonlinear behavior. Um, but you know this last point is particularly important because you know uh, one thing that's very important in building models is uh, debugging those models and figuring out where my problems are. And I've already mentioned that we should be building models from the ground up, not in terms of you know starting from the ground and building our entire building, but in terms of um, looking at smaller bits of my model as starting points and uh, making sure that those little bits work before incorporating them in a in a big building. But let's say I I, I get to the point where I am uh, building either my smaller model or my whole model. And I suspect, I'm not sure where my problem is, but I suspect maybe my sections are the problem because that's where the nonlinear behavior is. So that's probably pretty likely. Then one thing I could do is I could temporarily replace my sections with elastic sections. So if I have elastic sections, I know that they're going to, uh, you know, um, behave well. They won't um, um, have stability problems probably. So I can uh, use that elastic section uh, to debug my model. So that would then pinpoint, you know, if I change all my regular sections, nonlinear sections to elastic sections, and that fixes the problem, uh, and my model is able to run, then I know where the problem is, at least, right? And then I can pinpoint more specifically what's happening. I can investigate further the section behavior. I can build a separate model just to look at the section behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So that's probably the primary use of something like this in our types of models. Because if I'm going to use elastic sections, then probably I would just use an elastic beam column instead of having a distributed plasticity column with elastic sections. That wouldn't really make sense, right? Because I can just make a regular beam column without any plastic hinges and just define the, uh, the elastic behavior of this beam, and it will work very well. So I think this is more probably, you know, I use it more for debugging. Okay, what other type of sections? Okay, so I can define uniaxial section types. This is most of what we'll do, okay? And when I define the section type, I have to define um, which direction this section applies to. So, you know, in this section, I can define this section as being a moment rotation kind of section, or I can define it in terms of shear. Okay, so I can say this is just an axial force deformation type of section. This is a moment curvature type of section. This is a shear force type of section for 3D models. This is a torsion type of section. Um, and then if I have multiple of these and I want to combine them together, then I can use something called the section aggregator, which is, uh, you know, like I would build the sections first. Then I would use the section aggregator command to put multiple sections together into one. So if I have a moment curvature and a shear behavior that I both want to include, then I can do that, and then when I put my section into the beam, I'll use the aggregated section to do that. Um, one note, though, is when I aggregate sections together, like if I have moment and shear sections, then um, they will not interact. They will act totally separately. So if I have a nonlinear shear behavior, that nonlinear shear behavior has no idea what's happening with the axial stresses caused by the moment curvature or axial force. Um, so that's what I mean by there's no interaction. They're just, they would just be totally separate, but that could still be useful. So this is se section uniaxial. Section tag is a unique tag to define that section, so I can refer to it later when I want to put it in a beam. And then material tag is a previously defined material that's going to define the behavior of that section. And then the quantity is either axial force deformation, moment curvature, shear force, shear deformation, or torsion. Okay, so that's how I define each of those. So quantity is either P, M, Z, etc. And how to do this exactly is laid out in the manual. Um, so that is, in this case, all of these will be separate. So if I have an axial force deformation section, a moment curvature section, those two would also not know what the other is doing. So the axial force will not affect the moment strength, okay, if I do it like this. And that's the primary benefit, actually, of using a fiber section. Because if I use a fiber section instead, then I get automatically the interaction between the axial force and the moment together. So uh, when I do this, basically, I have to define the geometry of the cross section. And it actually saves me the trouble as well of having to model ahead of time using some other program or hand calculations uh, 
what should be the moment curvature behavior. So let's say I have this beam here. I have this beam. And if I wanted to do it with a regular section, one of these you know, regular uniaxial sections, then I need to define a material that represents the moment curvature behavior of that section. Okay, how do I know what the moment curvature of behavior of that section is? Well, I would have to look and say, there's so many bars here, there's so many bars here. Um, you know, I can calculate approximately what's the yield moment, what is the ductility going to be, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Or I could use another piece of software that does sectional analysis for concrete beams, like Response 2000 or something like that. Output what the moment rotation, moment curvature behavior is. Get all those parameters and put them into a uniaxial section, and then put those into um, a beam. If I use the fiber section in OpenSea, it's very convenient because all I have to do is I define the material property. So I'm going to define concrete material. I'm going to define a steel material for the rebar. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out the cross section. So I'm going to say I have a rectangle of concrete. I'm going to define how I discretize it, how many individual fibers I'm going to have. You know, you can see here that this concrete is broken up into individual fibers. And then I'm going to apply the concrete material to those fibers. Then I'm going to define the locations of the rebar. And then I'm going to apply the steel material to those rebar locations. And then OpenSea is going to take care of doing all of the section integration to figure out what is the moment and uh, curvature at every time step, including all the nonlinear behavior that we get from the material. So it's very convenient. So how do I define something like this? Um, you know, and you know, as I mentioned before, it includes moment and axial force interaction on the section. So what I do is first I define a section that is of type fiber. I give it a unique tag. If I want to include shear stiffness, I can. So this is just a linear shear stiffness. This will not have any nonlinear. It will not have any nonlinear behavior, and it will not interact at all with the axial moment. But if I have a short beam and I just want to make sure that I'm at least um, getting some realistic um, shear deformations, linear shear deformations, I can include that. Okay. So anyway, so I define my section. Most important thing is called fiber. I give it a unique section tag integer, and then I just go ahead and I define my fibers. So I could do that individually. So I could say, here's one fiber, here's another fiber with a certain area, here's another fiber with a certain area, and I can do that over the entire cross section. Of course, that would be very tedious. So of course, there's also ways to define a patch. So I can say, I'm going to make a rectangular patch, which is going to represent all the concrete fibers. And it's going to be, it's going to be this wide, and it's going to be this tall, and it's going to have x many fibers along the depth, x many fibers along the width. And those fibers are all going to have this specific concrete material. Or I can define a layer of rebar. Here's uh, three fibers all in a row. They go from here to here. OK, so that's, um, that's pretty good. There's also some, um, some built-in sections uh, that make it a bit easier for some common situations, like defining an I-beam cross-section. You can just define the geometry and give it a material, and it will help you to work that out. I'm going to show that in a minute. OK, so these are the different fiber types. So as I said, I can have a single individual fiber that could represent one rebar. It could represent one little bit of cross-section of concrete. It could represent one little bit of a cross-section of steel or whatever else I have. OK, so then I just have to say, this is the location. And it's Y and Z because these are cross-sectional um, axes. Okay, so if you assume that X is along the dimension of the beam, Y and Z here are the cross section dimensions. So you can see here Y and Z axes. Okay, so I can just say I have one fiber here, one fiber here, one fiber here, one fiber here. I could define each of these fibers individually if I want. Or I can make a patch which makes the fibers um, all at once. Okay, so here's a quad patch. It's just a general. Um, um, quadra uh, quadrilateral, right? And I just define the four corners and I divide how many subdivisions I want. So that'll define how many fibers I have in this direction, how many I have in this direction, and it will automatically uh, set all those up for me. Or if I have uh, something that is aligned with the grid, then I can use rectangle instead, in which case I only have to define two corners and again the subdivisions. Or I can have a circular patch. So if I have a round column, um, then it's um, helpful to be able to make uh, circular patches as well. 
I define an inner radius, that could be zero. I define an outer radius, I define the start of the arc, end of the arc, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the details for those things are in the manual. I can define a layer, so if I have rebar, for example, this is like very common for rebar. You know, I have a wall and I have like 20 rebar along a length and I say I, the rebar layer starts here and it ends here and I have this many rebar along that length. And uh, so that's very easy to define. Or I can do it in a circle too. So if I'm doing a circular column again and I have rebar all around the outside, I can make a circular layer of uh, rebar that goes all the way around the outside. Um, you know, as I mentioned, there are some pre-configured ones that make it a bit easier. There's this WF section 2D, so that's wide flange section two-dimensional. So instead of having to define individual patches like rectangles for the two flanges and another one for the web, here we can just define a unique section tag to identify the section, a material tag that defines what material each of these elements are, presumably some kind of steel, and then the D is the depth, the thickness of the web, the width of the flange, and the thickness of the flange, and then the number of fibers in the web and the number of fibers in the flange. And then it, kind of, it makes everything automatically, so it makes it a lot easier to define like a steel I-beam, which is such a common thing to do. Um, same thing for uh, rectangular concrete sections. Um, you can define just basically um, a, a tag, a unique tag for this section that I'll refer to later that you will refer to later when you put it into a beam. You define a material, a concrete material for the core area that's within the rebar. So again, right, like that's confined concrete, so it might be stronger and have more ductility. Um, you can define a concrete material for the cover, so the area outside the rebar, uh, material for the steel rebar, the depth and width of the total section, the cover depth, so that knows how wide this section is the area of rebar at the top, the area of rebar at the bottom, and the area of rebar on the sides, and then the number of fibers in the core and the cover, and the number of, um, uh, I don't remember what this is, maybe number of steel, steel fibers. <clears throat> okay, so I can aggregate, I mentioned the section aggregator before, but if I had a fiber section, for example, and I wanted to add a shear behavior, a nonlinear shear behavior that was not does not, again, these will not interact, okay, but I could add it using the section aggregator. So I could put my fiber section together with a shear force deformation section and um, make basically an, effect, an effective section defined by a new section tag that I can then use to put into my concrete beams or beam columns or whatever beam columns I have. <clears throat> okay, so that covers off material models and section models. Obviously those have to go somewhere. We need to end up putting those into a beam somewhere, right? So um, if I'm doing a beam column, then I might have sections, um, but there's lots of elements. I can do a spring element, you know, I can do a truss element, you know, what kind of things go into that. Okay, so that's um, elements now. Okay, and the elements have geometric transformations. We're gonna get into the transformations as well in a minute, okay. So, you know, elements are the key parts of our model. Our model has materials defined, it has sections defined, but it's the elements that are actually the bits of our model. They're the parts of our model that, that uh, connect together and fit together and define. This is where the overall stiffness is defined. And um, so every type of element is going to require some material or some sections, one or the other. Um, and those materials or sections are going to define how those elements def uh, act in the nonlinear, their nonlinear behavior. Um, and there might be more than one in a single element. It might be that I have one in, a, I can have different materials in different directions, or I have a layered material, layered sections like the concrete wall that we were looking at, or I have multiple sections, and those sections don't necessarily all need to have the same behavior. Okay, so what kind of elements? The absolute simplest element is um, a truss element, right? So it's an element that goes between two nodes and it only has axial behavior. It does not have any bending, does not have any shear. Why? Because a truss element by definition 
has pinned ends, so I can't actually rotate the ends. I can only uh, displace them, right? Um, this The regular base truss element that's just called truss also does not include geometric nonlinearity. Truss elements in OpenSeas are a bit weird because we define the geometric nonlinearity for them different than we do for other elements. We'll see how. Um, but it is possible to consider strain rate effects, so speed of loading. And um, you can put a damping elements in here. I can put a viscous damper on this and use my truss element then as a viscous damper. Okay, so how do I define elements? Similar to how I did materials. So when I had material, I did uniaxial material, then I had the material name, then I gave it a unique tag, then I gave it a bunch of parameters that define the behavior of the material. For the element, I put the element, the element is the command that I use. Then I give it the type of element that I want to use. So in this case, a truss element in quotes, single quotes. Then I give it a unique element tag, okay, that tells me uh, that I can use later if I need to refer to that element, like when I want to use a recorder and I want to say, I want the deformations of this element later saved. So I need a way to refer to that element. So I give it a tag, which is an integer. And then I have to define which nodes that element connects to. So, uh, you know, this, elem this truss element connects between nodes two and three. And I've previously defined the locations of those nodes with node commands. And so the nodes have locations. And then all I have to do with my elements is connect them together. So I provide a list of the nodes here. I can just put them one comma two in this case. I have to give my truss a cross-sectional area, okay, so that it can define the stiffness, and I have to give it a material, okay. So with trusses, you have to be a bit careful because the when I define the material, the vertical axis should be force, but the horizontal axis, um, sorry, the vertical axis should be stress, and the horizontal axis should be strain. Why? Because the force is going to come from the stress multiplied by this area that you give. And the strain is going to come based on the length of the truss element. So I define a material. I give this the tag of the material that I previously defined. And then that, that uh, puts together my truss. <clears throat> OK, uh, so you have to be careful because um, if I want to calculate the stiffness, like so let's say I have a truss element and I want that truss element to have a certain stiffness, a certain linear stiffness, for example. So I define my material and then in my material I say, okay, well the stiffness of this material is supposed to be, uh, you know, 10 uh, kilonewtons per millimeter or something like that. Well, you can't define it in terms of kilonewtons per millimeter like I just said because um, the length of the truss element itself is not something that I define in the input to the truss. It's defined based on the locations of the nodes. So based on how far apart these nodes are, that's how long the truss is. And so the stiffness of this truss is going to be the stiffness in terms of stress strain, so like the Young's modulus, multiplied by the area that I provide in the input, divided by the length, which is um, implied by the locations of these nodes that I never provide. So I have to be careful. Of same, the best way to figure out that something's working properly is just make a model that just has one truss element, give it the properties that you intend to use, make sure the geometry of the truss element is the geometry that you're going to use it, like aka the length is correct, and then pull and push on it and record the results and see that it behaves correctly, like how you intend it to behave. This is not just an open seas tip, obviously, this is for everything. SAP, SAP 2000, a ETAB, SAP Perform. You know, this is, a, this is the way to build models while having confidence that the model is modeling what you think it is. Okay, so the second type of truss element is co-rot truss. Okay, co-rotational is the terminology that OpenSeas uses to indicate large displacement um, behavior, geometric nonlinearity consideration. So. If you say that this is a co-rotational truss, then that means that it's going to take into account the change in location of the nodes when it calculates the forces and stiffness of the truss. Um, so if I'm doing geometric nonlinear analysis, uh, 
where I want to consider P delta effects, I want to consider large displacements in my structure explicitly, then I should use a co-rotational truss element. The reason that this is different than other elements is for, for a beam element, for example, I define a geometric transformation, which defines the nonlinear geometric behavior, and I give that geometric transformation a tag, and then I give that tag to the beam element, and then the beam element knows what transformation it's using. You'll notice for truss elements, there is no geometric transformation input. So the truss element knows whether it's going to do a large displacement analysis or a small displacement analysis, like I, i.e. A, an analysis that doesn't include geometric nonlinearity, based on the type of truss element. So the regular truss element does not include geometric nonlinearity. The co-rotational truss element does. Otherwise, these are identical models. Okay, zero length element is another one that's very useful because it allows us to do things like have discrete hinges in specific locations or to connect two things in a way that leaves a pin in between them. Um, okay, so zero length element means that I have an element that connects two nodes. Okay, so it has one node on one side of the element, one node on the other, but those nodes are in the same place. So they're both in the same position. So I have two nodes, one on top of the other, and the zero length element connects the two. Um, so for example, if I had a column and I had a beam, then I could have a column would have a node at the joint. The beam would also have a node at the joint, but those would be two different nodes with the same location. Then I could connect those two with a zero length element and I could define, I could give the zero length element a material behavior for the rotational component of its behavior to represent the yielding behavior of the end of the beam, for example. That's one way that I can make a plastic hinge at a discrete location that I control. Okay, so yeah, as I said, element with two nodes at the same location, I can have separate materials for each DOF. So since this is a 2D case here, so I have two nodes, node I, node J, they look like they're in different positions here, but you see the distance between them is zero. So it's just separated to be able to show the three stiffnesses. I have a horizontal stiffness, I have a vertical stiffness, and I have a rotational stiffness. So the nodes want to move this way relative to each other, this way relative to each other, or they want to rotate relative to each other. And I can define a different material behavior for each. Um, if I had that plastic hinge, then for X and Y, I would probably give it a linear material with a high stiffness so that those things are connected fairly rigidly. And then I would give it a rotational material that, is, that, that replicates the behavior of the plastic hinge, for example. Um, by default, the x direction and the y direction will align with the global x direction and the global y direction. If I want, I can rotate the directions, the local axis of the zero length element, whichever way I want by providing this optional um, orient um, uh, argument when I define the element. Okay, so I define my zero length element by saying zero length, that's the type, recognizing I have a capital L here. I give it a unique tag. I say which nodes, so node I is node three, node J is node 1000, so I put those here. Then I use this to indicate that I'm going to provide materials next, so I do quote, dash, mat, quote. Then I give it the tags for the materials in each direction. So if I have my X material is one material tag that I defined previously, another material tag that I defined previously for Y, and a third material that I defined previously for the K theta, the rotation. And then dash dir is for directions. I indicate which directions I'm providing those materials for. So if my materials for direction one, two, and three were in that order, I would put one, two, and three here. And that's how it's uh, defined. Um, similarly, I can have uh, an element that is kind of like a zero length element in that it has those springs. Um, oh, I should also mention, so for zero length elements, I can't provide stress strain in my materials, right? Why? Because this element has no area. It has no cross-sectional area. It has no length. So how can I define deformation based on strain. I can't, right? For the truss, it had a length. So if I have a certain strain, that means I can define what the deformation is, right? Because it's just the strain times the length. But here I don't have a length and I don't have an area. So when I define my material, 
I have to keep in mind when I'm defining my material that I have to define if I'm doing an axial material here, like the X material, I have to define it in terms of force and displacement. So my stiffnesses are gonna be in kilonewtons per millimeter. My force is gonna be in kilonewtons. My deformation is gonna be in millimeters instead of strain. So I have to pay attention when I define those. Similarly, that's how this two node link element works as well. It does not use the length, the distance between the nodes to calculate um, deformation. In, for each direction here, just like for the zero length element, I define the force deformation relationship or for the case of the rotational one, I define a moment rotation relationship using a material property. Um, so this is kind of like using a truss element, except a truss I can only do axial deformations and for a two node link I can do deformations in um, all three directions, axial, shear, and um, relative rotation. But just like the zero length element, there's no area, there's no length defined. Um, so um, this is very useful. I, I like to use this, like if you just need a spring somewhere and that spring has a certain length, I use this two node link element. That's what I would use for that. I've used it for cross braces. Like I have, if I use my sked brace in a model, I put node one is one corner of the frame, node two is node, you know, not node I is one corner, node J is the other corner. And then I define a two node link element. I give that two node link element uh, a direction one material that is the self-centering material defined in terms of force and displacement. And that's how I make a self-centering brace in a, in a model, very simple. Um, okay, so now for the more complex. So those are kind of the simple cases because I'm just defining force deformation or stress strain for individual degrees of freedom. For a beam column element, obviously, things are more complex because I need to um, consider um, stre uh, you know, stress and strain profiles along the depth of the beam. And if I'm doing distributed plasticity, then I have to consider those stress and strain profiles uh, at multiple points along the length of the beam. So how do we define that? Well, I mean, I can, um, first of all, do just an elastic beam column. That's the easiest case. That's here at the top. So if I define an elastic beam column, then I only have the two nodes. I give it the I, I give it the E, I give it the A, and that totally defines the elastic behavior, right? Just like the regular beam, uh, beam column that you would have um, derived in, uh, you know, if you took matrix structural analysis and you, you know, derive this, the constant stiffness matrix for a elastic beam element, that's exactly what this is, right? So I just say elastic beam column, I give it a unique tag, I say which nodes is it connected to again, so where is it in the model, what's the cross-sectional area, what's the Young's modulus, and what is the I, what is the second moment of area or moment of inertia. And then you see here is the transfer tag that I was mentioning before. This defines the geometric transformation, which we're going to talk about later. Okay, so depending on whether I want to consider large displacements, nonlinear geometry or not, I will give it a different transfer tag, which is associated with a certain previously defined geometric transformation object. Um, so that's the basic beam column element. I can put a mass along the length. Um, I don't really like doing this, you know, like I had a student recently making a model and they tried to do mass along the length of the element and you're supposed to give it like a mass per unit length and then it's supposed to automatically calculate the mass. I don't like doing that. It doesn't work that well. Um, um, or at least the way that he did it, it totally messed up the model. So, I mean, I would recommend that you stick to lumped mass. So you can put lumped mass at the nodes and whether it's on the nodes or it's spread out along the beam. You know, if you really need to spread mass along the length of a beam, then I would split that beam into multiple elements that have multiple nodes, and I would put mass on the nodes. And then you have, like, exact control over how much mass is in which location. I think that's much better. Um, okay, so that's elastic. Now, what about inelastic beam columns? And this is really what we're interested in, obviously. Um, and... Um, how do we define a nonlinear, what we call a nonlinear beam column element? Well, there's two different types in open seas. I'm going to go over in some excruciating detail how each one is defined and how they are, um, how they're made, like how they calculate 
Um, so there's two types. There's displacement based and then there is force based. Okay, and that doesn't mean that one does displacement and one does force. Um, you know, we're going to see what displacement based and force based mean um, in a minute. Okay, it doesn't have to do with the type of analysis. It doesn't mean that I'm applying forces or I apply displacements. I can use either type in uh, any model. And both of these are uh, distributed plasticity elements, which means that we have plastic sections all the way along the length. Um, so here we have, and we'll call those integration points, but those are the locations of the sections. Those are where all those section calculations are being done. I may or may not have an integration point at the end where the node is. In some schemes I do and others I don't and I might be interested in having one at the end or not. That's up to me to determine. Um, I can also have displacement based or force based beam column elements that have um, plastic hinges and there are um, some better plastic hinge models and some worse plastic hinge models. There's this model called the hinge Radau, which we'll talk about, and I'll give you a paper to read about it um, that um, um, that works uh, that works well. That I would recommend if you want to have kind of discrete plastic hinges, but you can apply that to this distributed plasticity model no problem without having to make separate uh, you know zero length elements to do discrete plastic hinges and stuff. Okay, so we looked at this before. Okay, so we're looking at a distributed plasticity model. So we can do with this beam column element, we can do the finite length hinge zones, or we can also do fiber sections, okay? Uh, like at, at multiple integration points along the length. Uh, they could be fiber sections, or they could also be just for uh, moment rotation sections, like we talked about before, uniaxial sections. <clears throat> okay, so the difference between displacement-based and force-based beam columns uh, all comes down to the assumptions that OpenSeas makes when it tries to solve the, um, the forces and stiffness of that element for the next step in the analysis. Okay, so for both types, the way that the analysis works is that what comes to the element is the deformation. Okay, so Open Seas is keeping track of all of the deformations of all of the nodes. And how does it get those deformations? Well, it does it by um, uh, doing basically what's equivalent to what we talked about before, which is like a Gaussian elimination, right? We looked at, um, we're going to look at time history analysis in more detail in a later lecture, but basically it has a stiffness matrix, it has a set of forces and um, um, it also has a mass matrix and a damping matrix, right? But it puts them all together into kind of like an effective stiffness matrix with an effective force vector. And it can do what's akin to basically doing a Gaussian elimination to calculate all of the displacements for that step. And then takes those displacements and it gives them to the elements and then it asks the elements to send back what are your element forces and what's your updated stiffness so that I can put those into the big stiffness matrix to calculate the next step. Okay, so coming to the element at the beginning of the step, of the time step, right, because we're doing an incremental analysis at multiple points in time, at the beginning of each time step, the node get the, sorry, the element gets the displacements that are applied at each of its nodes. So in this case, we have a beam column. The beam column is going to get the displacement at node I and the displacement at node J. Okay, so we get the nodal deformations at node I and J, then we have to find, if I'm the element, the element has to find what are the nodal forces, that's the forces at each end required to achieve those deformations, and what is the associated tangent stiffness matrix, which means what's your current stiffness? Okay, why does that change? Because the element is nonlinear, all the materials are nonlinear, so that means the stiffness changes all the time. So in order for OpenSeas to solve the next step, it has to know the stiffness. I need to know the stiffness matrix in order to find the deformations. Okay, so I have, all, I have my element. It has defined integration points all along the length. And OpenSeas gives the element the deformations and says, give me back the force and the stiffness. 
So let's look at how this is done for a displacement based beam column element. Okay, so this is all the steps that OpenSeas goes through to solve that problem of given the displacements, the deformations at the nodes, what are the forces? Okay, so the first thing it does, start with the element properties and apply nodal deformations at each end so it gives, has the deformations, okay, based on the analysis using global tangent stiffness developed during the previous step. So that's OpenSeas does a global tangent stiffness matrix in the previous time step and it calculates the new deformations and it gives those to OpenSeas. And basically what I end up with is, okay, here's my element in a global space, so it could be at an angle. It gives me, this is U1, U2, U3, U4, U5, U6. All of the deformations, three degrees of freedom at each node. Okay, and those are in the same direction as the global axes, right? So my, my entire system has a x-axis, a y-axis, and these are in the same direction as those, okay? Then, this is where it does the transformation. Okay, so this is where the geometric transformation comes in too. It does a transformation between the global six degrees of freedom and a local three degrees of freedom. Okay, in order to define the deformation of this element, all the internal, internal deformations of this element, all I need are three um, degrees of freedom. Why? Because I can take out all of the rigid body rotations. Okay, so this element, if it's like this, and it moves here, or it moves here, I can, you can imagine that I can move that element without adding any stress to it, right? I have this pen. I can move this pen around in space without adding any stress. Like the DOFs are all changing, but the pen is unstressed. What I'm interested in, if I'm calculating, um, if I'm the elements and I'm calculating is, I wanna know how are the local deformations related to the stresses that are on this element. Okay, so I need to know only that component of these deformations that's causing the force and the moment in the element to change. So I can do a transformation. We'll look into the transformation in more detail. I can do a transformation to convert those six DOFs to only three. So which basically an axial deformation, which is related to axial stress, and two rotations, one at each end, that are related to the, the uh, moment, the internal moment. Okay. So then this, at this point, the displacement based beam column makes a big assumption. And this is basically why, spoiler alert, this one is um, kind of less accurate than the force based beam column element that we're gonna look at, okay? What it does is it assumes a constant axial strain and a constant linear curvature distribution from end to end, okay? So my element has a certain axial um, deformation from end to end, right? So I have a relative deformation between this end at this end, either making it go into tension or going to compression, and that provides a strain in the element, an axial strain, and it assumes that the axial strain is constant. That's a good assumption, right? That makes total sense. Uh, we would assume that it's constant because I only have a deformation at one end and a deformation at the other end. It's the relative deformation between the two that causes a strain. And I have a rotation at one end and a rotation at the other end that cause curvature in the element, right? It makes the element want to bend. I wish I had my ruler, but it makes the element want to bend, right? It's gonna have some kind of shape depending on how much deformation here, how much deformation here. So that means that at either end, there's gonna be some curvature to the element based on the curvatures directly related to moment, right? And it assumes that it has a linear curvature distribution between either end, right? Why do I need to know the distribution? Because remember, I have integration points along the length of this element, and I'm gonna be interested in what's the strain and curvature at each integration point if I wanna figure out what are the forces and stresses, right? So it assumes that it has a linear curvature distribution. Now for a linear element, like if I had just a linear beam, a beam that never yields, then that's a good assumption. Like it, it will be a linear curvature distribution. But once I get into the nonlinear behavior, the curvature distribution is not gonna be linear anymore, right? Because for a beam, how do we model a beam? Like we put plastic hinges at the end, potentially. Why would we put plastic hinges at the end? Because that's where the moment is greatest in a beam, and that's where the yielding is expected to occur in a beam, generally in an earthquake, right? So at the ends of the beam, we're gonna get yielding, and what happens when the beam yields in moment? The curvature goes way up, 
right? I have moments when I have a linear moment relationship and then once it yields, the stiffness goes down a lot and so I'm gonna get focused curvature at those points where it's yielding. So I'm gonna have big jumps in curvature at the ends. You can't see the other end, but there's a, there's a bump down here. There's a peak in the curvature. Okay, so that means if I make a linear curvature assumption between the two ends, I would draw a straight line between this end and the other end. And you'll notice now that the uh, distribution doesn't look at all like that anymore. So it's a pretty big assumption for nonlinear elements. Again, for linear elements, this would be a good assumption. But now that we have nonlinear elements and we have concentration of curvatures caused by yielding, this is not a really great assumption anymore. So if we want to use this element, we're going to have to pay attention to this fact. And we can still use it, but we have to, we have to, um, we have to do some additional things in order to use it. Okay, so now it has figured out axial strain and curvature distribution, which again were based on the axial deformation and the axial ro and the rotations at either end. So it comes up with axial strain and a curvature distribution. Okay, so then we know that we have um, integration points. So each of these blue dots represents an integration. We might have a few of those. We might have more of those. We get to define how many integration points there are. So based on the strain curvature assumption, uniform axial strain, linear curvature strain, find the approximate solution for the strain curvature for all integration points on the beam based on the known nodal displacements. Okay, so this is very easy because basically it's just saying the strain at this integration point, the axial strain is this, and so if this is the third integration point here, and the curvature is this, and this particular one it happens to be zero. So E1 is the axial strain, E2 is the curvature at that integration point. Okay, so then now that I know the curvature and I know the axial strain, I go to each integration point in turn and I can calculate the resulting sectional forces from the strain and the curvature. Okay, this is like what we do when we do concrete beam design, right? And then that allows us to get the total section behavior. So at a section, I find the stresses at each fiber and then I integrate the stresses to get the overall moment and axial force at that section. Okay, so how is this? Here I have E. E is the strain profile. How do I get E? Well, I have the axial strain and I have the curvature. Right? The curvature is the slope of the strain profile. And the axial strain is the shift in this profile. Right. So if I had only curvature, I would have a symmetric uh, strain profile like this. And then since I have an axial strain, it gets shifted over to the right, and I get an overall strain profile. Then once I know the strain profile, I can figure out the stresses for each fiber, right? So I have a rebar here. This rebar has a certain strain, also taking into account the history of the strain, because remember we have a hysteresis, but we have a certain strain. That strain then is going to cause a certain stress. That stress, that could be in the linear range or it could be in the nonlinear range. This could be a stress after yielding. It could be a stress before yielding. Just wherever that is on the next step finds here's this new strain what is the new stress so it does that for all the rebars it does it for all of the layers of concrete and so I get stress in the concrete and I get stress in the rebars and now that I have the stresses and I know the areas right because I know the area of the rebar I know the area of each concrete fiber I can convert those stresses to forces and then I can manually integrate all of these which means basically just add them up in order to get the overall moment and the overall axial force so s1 here is the axial force s2 is the moment so starting with a strain profile i get a stress profile stress profile turns into forces when i multiply them by areas and then those forces i can find the moment how do i find the moment you remember how to do this i start at one point and then I just find all of the moments, right? Like I take a sum of moments equal to zero. So I just take a sum of moments about this part, about this point or this point or any point, and I just say this is a force times a distance, this is a force times a distance, this is a force times a distance, force times a distance. I add them all together and I get the moment, right? So that part is very easy, especially for a computer to do.
So that's integrating stress over the depth of the section to get overall section forces. It's just adding them together to get the, the, the shear force in the moment. Or it's not the shear force, the axial force in the moment. Okay. So then, then I end up with that. I do that at each integration point. And then once I have that for each integration point, then I can use virtual work to find the end forces at the end of the member. Okay. And this is where the kind of... Um, um, weighting of the integration points. That's why we call these integration points because it's like we have a shape function, we have integration points. If you take a finite element analysis, then you'll kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about. But we use uh, weighted values here and depending on how we spread these points out, we'll use different weights in order to determine these end forces. Okay, And so now these end forces are the end result of the analysis that we have to send back to OpenSeas that combined with the stiffness, which is calculated kind of in a similar way. So since the assumed curvature distribution was approximate, and the section forces were calculated based on those, based on those approximate curvatures, these forces are also approximate. So the forces at the member ends won't be exact, which means that this is weak equilibrium. So <clears throat> since I had a curvature distribution that didn't actually match probably very well my true curvature distribution, um, I'm not guaranteed that my equilibrium is actually working out properly. So that's why this ends up being uh, kind of an approximate solution. <clears throat> um, so then once I end up with these section forces Q, sorry, I said that was the total end of the story, but that's not really true because I have to take those end forces and I have to retransfer those back into the global coordinate system again. And uh, that's what I give back to open seas. And I also have to calculate the stiffness matrix which I do by doing a partial differential, like a, a numerical partial differential on the force relative to the uh, displacement. Okay. <clears throat> so here's my real, again, real curvature distribution, and here's what the model is suggesting. So what could I do to use the displacement-based beam column element and get better results? Well, what I could do is I could use more elements. So instead of just using one element with three integration points, I can use four different elements. So I still have end nodes in the same place, but now my curvature distribution will better follow the true curvature distribution. So if I'm using displacement-based beam column elements, then it's a good idea to use multiple ones over the height of a, of a column or over the length of a beam, and then I'll get better results. And um, why might I want to do that? Because this analysis is pretty quick. There's no iteration. It just starts from the beginning. I get my strain, my curvature, from that I get my um, section strains and curvature, from that I get my section forces, from my section forces I get my end forces, from my end forces I get my global end forces and my stiffness matrix, and then I give those back to open season and I'm done, so it's very quick. You'll notice that the force based is not so quick. Okay, so what happens now for force based beam column solutions? So this is the other type of beam column element. How does this one happen to solve? Well, it starts the same way. So I get the end deformations from OpenSea's previous analysis. Like from the previous time step, it gets the deformations. It gives the new deformations to the element. The element then has to transform those global deformations into what are called in the OpenSea's parlance the natural element deformations, which are local to the element, basically. Again, the same three degrees of freedom. Uh, they're aligned with the elements local axis directions, which are different potentially than the global axis directions. Okay, now here's where it starts to get different. So, instead of assuming constant axial strain and linear curvature, okay, which was a good assumption for strain but a bad assumption for curvature for nonlinear elements, force-based beam column makes an assumption instead about the load and the moment distribution, right? So you can start to see already you say, well, we needed those curvatures and we needed those uh, strains in order to calculate the load. So how do we start with loads? We're starting backwards. But now we're making an assumption that aligns well with equilibrium, right? So we're assuming that the axial force is constant, which is a good assumption because we only have loads at the ends. And we're assuming that the moment distribution is linear, which is a good assumption. Even if it goes nonlinear, the moment distribution between the two ends will um, will be approximately linear. 
right? So this is a better this is a better set of assumptions to start our analysis. But we're starting our analysis with four set moments. So now what do we do? Well, the answer is we're going to use those as targets, and we're going to iterate to come up with um, to come up with the true values. So how do I even get this axial force? Because I don't know the forces. I I can say I'm going to assume that the axial force distribution is constant. But I don't know what the axial force is, so how do I know where to set this? The answer is I'm going to use a starting assumption, and then I'm going to iterate, and then see if my assumption was correct. And if my assumption wasn't correct, I'm going to change my starting assumption and do the entire analysis over again. I'm going to do that the same with the moments. Now, it's not as bad as all that, because I probably already have some pretty good starting assumptions, because I'm probably just going to use the the results of the previous step as the starting assumption, right? So in order to get the forces and moments, I need the end forces and moments, which are what we're trying to find in the first place, as I was saying. So, so we use an iterative procedure. We guess a value for Q. Q are the end forces. And we see if the Q results, if the Q results in the deformations that were given. So I can say, here's Q that I assumed. What are the deformations that would be associated with those end forces, Q, those deformations, which are called V, and then we see, are those, do those deformations match up with the deformations that OpenSeas gave us? And if the answer is no, then we iterate again. But it gets worse because there's actually a separate level, a second level of iteration that we need. Okay, So we start with our outer iteration. So we make a guess for the end forces. Again, remember, these are this is what we're trying to find is the end forces. So we make a guess for our end forces, and then we figure out what the forces are at each section using those two assumptions that we just talked about, constant axial force and linear distribution of moment. Okay, so I'm, I have some moment, I have some axial force. I can find out now at each integration point, at each section, what is the moment at this section and what's the axial force at this section, okay? Now again, before when we did the section analysis, we started with strains and curvatures, not with the section forces, right? So now we are given basically, now this gives us a target set of section forces, a section axial force and a section moment. And we're gonna have to iterate again to figure out what curvature and what axial strain would result in those section forces. Okay, so to start again, so iteration. So to find the resulting nodal deformations, check if the resulting nodal deformations match the gl given global deformations. And if not, uh, go back to step A and guess a new set of nodal forces. So that's the outer iteration, okay? that's This is the overall iteration. So the overall iteration is I find the section forces, and then I do an iteration to find the resulting deformations at the ends. I check to see if those deformations match the deformations that OpenSeas gave me. And if that's not the case, then I circle back and I pick a new set of cues. Now then we have to figure out, okay, well, so how do we figure out what are the nodal deformations, VR, these deformations, that are associated with the nodal forces that I guessed? That's the inner iteration, okay? So inner iteration is like the backward situation of what we did with displacement-based beam column, okay? Um, to find the resulting nodal deformations given section forces. So basically, I have these section forces, which came from these assumptions. So I say, okay, for this section, based on my assumption of end, mo end moment and end axial force, I have an axial force at this section, and I have a moment at this section. So I have these. These I know, I have the moment and the axial force. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to guess the two parameters, curvature and axial strain, which give me uh, a strain profile. Then I'm going to use that strain profile to calculate the stresses just like I did before. I'm gonna use those stresses with the areas of the fibers to calculate the end forces. And then I'm gonna check, did that curvature assumption give me the end forces that I was going for? If no, I'm going to change the curvature in the axial the axial um, strain profile again and see if I can get that moment again. And if not, I'm going to iterate again. So I'm going to iterate, iterate, iterate until I end up with a curvature 
profile, a curvature and axial strain, so a strain profile that gives me the moment and axial force that result from this assumption that I made that was based on the end load assumption that I got. Okay, so guess section curvature and axial strain, calculate the stress in each fiber, integrate all the fibers to get the section force, check if this force matches the section force that I calculated using the linear moment distribution, if not, go back and pick a new curvature and axial strain to get the strain profile. Once we get the curvature that matches, I'm going to do that for every single integration point. And then once I know the curvature and the axial strain at every integration point, then I can use that to calculate the nodal deformations using virtual work and the weights again. Uh, I'm using like a Gaussian quadrature, okay, if you're familiar with that process. And that will give me a set of, um, of rotations and axial deformation. And then I'm going to check if that matches the deformation that OpenSeas gave me. If not, pick a new set of end forces and repeat the entire process over again. So there's two sets of iteration. One, the outer set to pick a set of forces and then see if the resulting deformations match the deformation that OpenSeas gave me. The second iteration is one that happens at each integration point where I start with the section forces and have to calculate what are the uh, section curvature and axial strain that will result in those section forces. And then once I have all of those axial strains and curvatures, I kind of put them all together using Gaussian quadrature to figure out what the end rotations are and check those against what OpenSeas gave me. So that's a kind of complicated explanation, but um, um, so basically, since the deformation compatibility check is done using individual sections, so since I use that quadrature process at all the integration points, like I weight all of them and I put them together to get what the end rotations are, I'm not guaranteed to have compatibility. So that's why this one is called weak compatibility. So the displacement-based beam column was weak equilibrium because I made an assumption on curvature that wasn't necessarily true, and that's where the assumption comes in. And in this one, the assumption comes in um, because I am do, using Gaussian quadrature to estimate the deformation at the ends um, based on the uh, strain profiles at each individual integration point. Phew. <clears throat> okay, so once both of those levels of integration are done, then I have the end forces. And then I need to do the reverse transformation to get the global end forces. So I end up with forces at the ends here. I do an inverse transformation to get forces uh, in the global um, coordinate system. And then I need to calculate the flexibility matrix. And then I use that to get the tangent stiffness matrix, which I give back to OpenSeas if I'm the element. Okay, so that's the process for displacement-based versus force-based. So for force-based, since it uses exact equilibrium, that means I can use a single element and it will do a good job of representing the behavior of that element if the element's nonlinear. Even if I have concentration of curvature in specific locations, um, this element is still gonna do a pretty good job. But on the other hand, since I have these levels of iteration, um, it's going to take longer, okay? So there's a balance here for the displacement-based beam column. We said you should use more elements, okay? Well, more elements is gonna take longer too, right? So it's a balance between should I use force-based beam column elements and each one is gonna take longer to calculate or should I use displacement-based beam column elements but really I should have more elements. So those will also take longer to calculate. Well, the other benefit of force-based beam columns is it's much easier to build the model because I don't have to make all these little elements, right? If I make lots of elements, I need lots of nodes. So I have to place all those nodes. So it's kind of easier to use force-based. So I would usually use force-based is the bottom line. <clears throat> okay. In practice, how do I actually um, um, define these? <clears throat> like how do I make the displacement base beam column or the force base beam column? in open seas. Well, the first thing I need to do is to define an integration type. We'll talk about what those types are in a minute. That determines how it does the quadrature, the Gaussian quadrature part, the part where it puts all the elements together. 
to get the effective end forces or to get the effective end displacements of the element. Um, that defines whether I'm doing distributed plasticity or whether I'm doing discrete plastic hinges, like with plastic hinge zones. It also defines how many integration points I want to use. That's all in the beam integration. So I define a beam integration, I give it a type, I give it a unique tag so I can refer to it when I define the element, and I provide it with the arguments that are necessary, which you'll see what they are. Then after I define my beam integration type, and I can have multiple of these if I have multiple different types of beams that I want to use, then I define my beam column element either displacement-based beam column or force-based beam column. And again, I would, I would recommend probably in most cases you use this one. You can experiment though, especially on, um, on assignment one, you could experiment. You could totally experiment with displacement-based beam column because it's a very small model. It's easy to make more nodes if you like. I give that element a unique tag. I say which nodes it connects to, just like all the elements that we talked about before. I give it a transfer tag, which defines the geometric transformation. Is it doing large displacement analysis or not? And I give it an integration tag, which is a tag of one of the beam integration type elements. Then I have some optional things that I can add, again, like distributed mass and stuff that you probably, in most cases, don't have to worry about. <clears throat> OK, so what are the integration types? So again, this determines how the quadrature is done. This internally defines all those weights. So you don't have to define the weights. This has the weights all built in, the weights for each integration point. And it defines where the points are and how many there are. OK, so um, the kind of most accurate one, and you, know, you might remember this from finite element analysis if you had this in finite element analysis, the most accurate one is to use is uh, Gauss Legendre, or Legendre. I don't know how you would uh, like to pronounce it. Okay, this gives the optimum location of integration points. Integration points are never for optimum locations to get the best result, the most accurate result. They're not typically evenly spaced apart. Okay, so this has an optimum spacing with optimum weights. Okay, so this gives the best result, but this one also happens to not have an integration point right at the end of the element, which is not a big deal for overall behavior. But if I want to know what is the curvature and moment at the very end of the element, I won't be able to output that from Gauss Legendre. Okay, so I won't be able to get the moment and curvature here. So probably more common for um, distributed plasticity is to use uh, Gauss Lobato, which is which includes integration points at the very ends. So then I can look at this section in a recorder and I can say I want to see the section moment, the section shear, the section axial force, the section strain, the section curvature, the strain in a specific fiber in this section I can even find. Okay, so then I can do it at the end. So I say Lobato is the type, I give it a unique tag that I can relate to later. I tell it which section I want to use. So remember, we defined nonlinear sections previously. So I have fiber sections. So let's say I have a concrete beam and I've defined my fiber section. This is where I put the section tag that I previously defined. And then n is the number of integration points that I want along the length. And then the locations, again, the locations and the weights of where these should go and what the weights are is automatically defined by you know, there's an optimal, mathematically optimal arrangement for those. So this will be a little bit less accurate than Legendre, but it has the added benefit of having a point at the end. And it's going to be almost as accurate. Okay, there's another, um, you can also do Newton coats, which basically just means spread the integration points out evenly. So if you have a specific reason to want to do that, it's possible to do. You reduce your accuracy of the integration a little further. But you might be willing to make that um, uh, make that sacrifice in some cases, I guess. Or you could even put the integration points wherever you want and define the weights manually. <laughs> but you know, this says likely to be very inaccurate, <laughs> right? So if you don't know where to put those and what the weights should be, probably you're going to get something totally wrong. So probably in most cases, you'll use Lovato, I think. Or you're going to use a hinge type, OK? Um, so there's multiple types of hinge uh, models um, where it basically has 
integration points at the ends. Okay, so there's like hinge midpoint, so this makes a hinge. There's a plastic hinge, it defines the length of that hinge. So I say hinge midpoint, I give it a section type, I give it, um, uh, for the left side, I give it a section type and a plastic hinge length for the right side, and I give it uh, an E for the area in between, for assuming that the middle is elastic, but it doesn't have any integration points near the ends. You can only figure out what's happening at the hinge and um, there's a small integration error for linear curvature. So if I have a linear curvature distribution, this has a small error. Then they have a modified two-point hinge called hinge Radau, and this one is actually better. I have a, there's a nice paper on this and how it works and why it does a better job of representing curvature distributions well. But so if I wanna do plastic hinges, this adds an extra integration point in order to um, end up with a mathematically better result, basically. But the nice things are I still can define a plastic hinge length, which is very nice. And I have the, I have the, lo I have the location of one integration point right at the end so that I can determine the actual uh, moments and curvatures and stuff right at the end of the beam. So if you want to do a plastic hinge model and you don't want to define it manually using like a zero, point, zero length element, this is a very nice one to use. Okay, last part is talking about the geometric transformations. So what is that step where we go from global to local um, in the, um, uh, when we start to integrate our beams, right? So the first step is Usually we get the global elements and then we want to change, you know, I in the previous slides I only showed the global element which has deformations in three DOFs, you know, for a beam element. This applies to all elements, but for a beam element, three DOFs at the ends in the global coordinate system and then I showed you what was the end result which was a natural element with only three DOFs. Um, which just which um, basically get rid of all the rigid body modes of deformation, which I talked about before. Um, there's actually an intermediate step there where it just basically takes these global element deformations, all six of them, and rotates them into a local element axis before it goes through this process of removing the rigid body deformations. Okay, these are just matrix transformations, basically. It's not a very difficult process. Um, <clears throat> so just to review about what nonlinear geometry means, although I introduced it way at the beginning of the lecture. Okay, so usually when you calculate displacements in a model, in a linear model, basically the displacements, they're like parameters at the nodes. The nodes don't move. You know, the, the nodes in the model never move. The, the stiffnesses all stay the same, right? If I move this node, um, you know, really the stiffness should change because all these angles have changed and everything. But usually if we do a linear element, the locations of the node never change, but I could say, okay, so I've applied some load to this and that's provided a horizontal deformation of J at J of 10 millimeters. And that deformation is just the result of my analysis. Okay, so for all calculations of loads, moments, displacements, geometry of the element remains constant. The, load, the nodes don't move, the length is the same, right? So the length changes the same and the angle stays the same. So if this node were to move, this angle might change and also the length of this element might change as well, right? And that would change the stiffnesses. Now, in a lot of cases, this is fine, right? Um, if the displacements are small, that means the length won't change a lot, the angle won't change a lot. But there are some cases where this will make a big difference. And in buildings, there are a lot of cases where it does make a difference, especially if we're dealing with P delta effects, which we are required to um, take into account in our analyses. Like if you read the MBCC, it'll say specifically, you know, you need to take into account the effect of uh, P delta. Okay, so if the displacement gets big, so let's say I have a lateral displacement, then if I consider this to have constant geometry, then that would mean that as this displaces, the displacement is just a parameter at the node, and this axial load would still be in this location pushing down. So the axial load would have no additional effect. 
But if I allow the node to actually displace, then this axial load which existed before now causes not only axial stress in this element, but it is also going to cause now a bending effect, right? Because now there is a moment between where the load is applied and the resistance at the base here, right? So I have uh, multiple different effects that I can have here actually. So here is um, what happens to um, this is, so if I have V here, V creates a moment at the base, okay? So V creates a moment of V times L, V times the length, okay? If my P delta effect is ignored, then P never creates an additional moment. So this is, I'm looking at moment versus height. If I take P delta effects into account, that means that as this delta increases, this P creates an additional moment of P times delta, right? P times this lever arm. So at the base, I'll get an additional moment of P delta. That's the P, we call that the P big delta effect. In addition to that, since this now has a bent shape, if I put a load, an axial load on something that has a bent shape, that axial load wants to bend it more, right? Like if I have a bent, if I have something curved and I put an axial load on the end, the curvature means that the resistance basically is not all in, in line, right? So that means that if I add an, an axial load on the end of a curved member, it's gonna to wanna to bend, right? And that's what we call the P small delta effect. So that'll be maximum in the middle of the member, right? So these are the two different P delta effects that we can see in structures. Okay, um, you know, we see this in, um, we have a multi-story building and we push it over and there's tons of vertical loads on a multi-story building and as we push it over further those vertical loads have an effect of increasing the overturning moment in the entire building so it's not only a local effect on a specific element but the entire building wants to fall over sooner right so if i look at the uh, total base shear versus displacement of this building and if I didn't consider the gravity loads, then I would have this, this is like a pushover curve, right? So I have an initial stiffness, some yielding, and I still have post-yield stiffness. Well, with the gravity loads, it has the effect basically of reducing the stiffness, okay? Because as I push it further, the loads want to pull it. So that means that as I push it, this lateral load has an easier time pushing it over because the vertical loads are contributing and pushing it over. So from the point of view of the lateral load, it gets easier, which looks like a reduction in stiffness, right? So that means that my overall effective lateral stiffness decreases and I can reach a point here where it decreases to the point where the stiffness becomes negative. And of course, once the stiffness becomes negative, then the building is gonna fall over. Okay, so <clears throat> what does the math for transformation in general look like? <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> I can transform, these are loads. Okay, so I wanna transform global loads to natural loads. That means I have a transformation matrix T and that transformation matrix T is basically a big, in this case, I guess it's a three by six matrix, and it's gonna transform all six of these. Well, in this case, I'm transforming from natural to global. So it's gonna transform these three into six global deformations, okay? Um, this T, this total effective T transformation, it's just, a, it's just a matrix of numbers, right? And you've probably seen this before if you've taken matrix structural analysis, is, the uh, multiplication of two different uh, matrices, one that goes from global to the kind of local and one that goes from the local to the natural. And they're named in the sense in open seas, they're kind of named going from natural to local. So this one's to local and this one is to global. Okay, so that means that the T matrix goes from, from natural to global. So if I want to go the other way, I basically take the inverse. I just take the, tr the sorry, I take the um, um, transpose of those matrices and it goes the other way. So I have this one matrix, I can apply it to go in one direction and I can apply the transpose of it to go back. 
<clears throat> okay, so for um, when I have a beam column element, um, there's two different things that can change. So you can imagine in the linear in the linear transformation, this is pretty easy. Like you can imagine there's going to be some sine theta term in there and cos theta terms, and uh, and that's basically going to be it, right? Because I'm just made, basically I'm just rotating things, more or less. Okay. Um, so what happens if I have a nonlinear geometric case? Well, okay, so there's for beam column element, let's think specifically about beam column elements, there's two different things that can change. One is the length, as I mentioned before, and the other is the angle. The, the angle with respect to the global coordinate system, basically. Okay, so if I do a full nonlinear geometry, then I'm going to, these are what the matrices look like. Remember I said there's sines and coses. These are to rotate things, right? And I have a one here because in the rotational direction, um, there's no transformation applied to moment, right? Because moment doesn't change depending on if I rotate my coordinate system. So that's why there's ones here. This might ring a bell for a lot of you. Okay, so if I wanna do a full nonlinear geometry, when I apply these, T to global and T to local in order to transform between the global coordinate system and the local coordinate system or the natural coordinate system, I'm going to recalculate the new beta and the new L at every time step. So what OpenSeas has to do is look at the new positions of the nodes based on previous deformations that have occurred, calculate what is the current length of this element and what is the current angle of this element um, with respect to the global coordinate system. You can imagine those calculations are pretty straightforward. And then it's going to take those current beta and L values and it's going to plug those in here. And then it is going to um, apply those two matrices to the force in order to transfer those forces from global to local. Okay, pretty straightforward. If I was doing a linear analysis, then I would be only using the initial value of beta and the initial value of L at the beginning of the analysis and I would keep using that at every time step and I would never change them. So I would save on each step the process of calculating a new B, a new L and um, coming up with these, assembling these new matrices. So if I have a linear geometry I'm going to start with L0 and beta 0, those are the angle and the length at the beginning of the process and I'm just going to use them for every single time step, and I'm never going to consider changing them. Okay, in OpenSeas, besides the two, this is full nonlinear geometry, so this is full consideration of the movement of nodes. This is quite expensive, okay? It takes quite a lot more time to do this because there's all of these extra steps for every single element at every time step to recalculate these matrices, okay? These matrices only have to be calculated once if I do it in linear. So then on top of that, there is a third type of transformation, which is called a P-delta transformation, which is a kind of in-between of those two. So basically, this first element will never change. The angle will never change. Okay, But to take into account this P-large delta effect, okay, the effect of an axial force causing an additional moment, there is an additional term added here into the second um, equation, which just finds the relative delta y for each node. So how far do these nodes go relative to each other? Perpendicular to the axial direction. So it only needs to calculate one parameter, this delta y, and it only has to change one of these matrices. So that means that it takes less time to do the P delta transformation. Now in practice, you might not notice that big of a difference between P delta and co-rotational. It depends on, depends on the situation, depends on what kind of elements you have in the model, how many there are, et cetera, et cetera. But P delta transformation does um, pretty much just as good of a job as the full co-rotational for most types of situations that we run into in structural analysis. So when would I want to use these linear I think for realistic analyses that we want to do, even in our course, I think we have very little um, cause to use linear transformations uh, unless we're just doing a small toy model and we're not, we're not interested in those kind of things for, you know, like a small partial model that we're doing. 
Um, P delta is almost as fast as linear and almost as accurate as co-rotational. So it's like a nice happy medium. This is the minimum type of geometric transformation that we should be doing in our analyses, probably is at least P delta. Um, if you have really high load levels, then it might not be accurate. So it's good for low to medium levels of axial load, um, which probably applies to most of our situations. We don't usually have axial loads in columns that are um, so high that, um, you know, like we're buckling the columns or something like that, right? Mostly we're interested in P-delta effects because of the global effect of the overturning of the whole building. And co-rotational is the most accurate, but it's also the most expensive. So that I think is pretty straightforward. How do we define the geometric transformations? Um, okay, so we already mentioned that for trusses, um, I do it by picking either truss or co-rotational truss, so I use a different element type. If I do not want to include geometric transformations or if I do want to include geometric transformations for those trusses. For zero length element, there is no transformation because everything is already in global, typically, or in a rotated um, axis, but it's all inherent to the element, so we don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> Mostly we have to worry about it for beam columns. So for beam columns, before we define the beam column element, we need to define a geometric transformation. And this is very easy. Okay, geometric transformation, I just say what type it is. So linear, p-delta, or co-rotational, in quotes. I give it a unique tag, integer. This is so that I can refer to it later. So when I build my beam, I say use transformation number one or transformation number two. And then I have some optional arguments. And the only really optional argument that you might want to use probably is applying a joint offset. What a joint offset means is I have a beam and let's say that I have a beam is framing into a column. Okay, well, the column has a certain width and the beam has a certain depth. But when I model the beam in the column, I'm going to model those along the center line of the beam in the center line of the column, right? So they're going to join you know, if I have a continuous column and I have a beam framing into it, they're going to join like halfway into the column, right? They're going to join at the center line of the column. So that means that there's part of this beam element that's not actually beam. Like there's part of this beam element that is the width of the column. So if I like, what I can do is I can apply what's called a joint offset, which means that I'm going to consider the end of the beam element, the part that is within the column, the half of the column, to be totally rigid so that it's not part of the beam. So then I get a more realistic um, stiffness for that beam, right? Because obviously the inside of the column, which is part of the beam element, doesn't bend like a beam, right? So I can apply joint offset. If I do this, then I end up with a lot of geometric transformations and I just have to keep track of which beam I'm talking about and stuff. I do that, uh, I think I do that, I, I definitely have sample models where I do that, that you can go and see. Um, if I don't need joint offsets, then it's very simple. I just have geometric transformation, P delta, I give it a tag, I close the bracket, and that's it. And I can use the same one for every element, basically. Okay, so now we talked last week about 3D structures and needing to lay out diaphragms and make sure that the distribution of mass was correct and everything and mo actually modeling the gravity frame so that we can take into account P delta effects. Now what happens if we build a 2D model, like most of the models that we're going to build in this course are going to be 2D. How do we take advantage, how do we model the gravity frame? Because the gravity frame, you know, I might have a braced frame on one edge of the building and then I have a gravity frame interior to that, but that gravity frame is not in line with the, the main um, seismic force resisting system that I want to model. So how do I take that into account? Because I must consider P delta effects. Well, one way to do that is to add what's called a leaning column. So here, let's say I have a lateral frame. Let's say that this is a moment frame. And this is just one side of the building. And it has a moment frame on that side. And that's providing a lateral resistance, seismic force resistance in that direction. So maybe I have three bays of that lateral frame. And I have all sorts of nonlinear elements and stuff in here. I have beams that yield. And I've made plastic hinges. And I've applied the correct transformations and everything. Well, to represent, and that frame has, it has some gravity loads, but it only has the gravity loads that are directly next to the frame, right? Because if I do tributary area of the floor, 
some of that load is going to be directly on top of the moment frame, but some of it is going to be interior to that. And actually most of the load in the building is going to be on the gravity columns, which are interior and not at all close to the moment frame. So what I can do is I can apply the loads that are directly tributary to the moment frame on it. That's a good thing to do. But then all of the other load that's sitting on gravity columns, I collect all that load and I put it together and I put it on a leaning column. And this leaning column, it could just be made of truss elements. Okay. And those truss elements could be pin ended. Okay. Even. And I put all of that load that is tributary, that is not tributary to the main frame. I put that all on the gravity leaning column. And so all this leaning column does is just gives us a place to put this load. And it's a place that's going to deform laterally with the building. So that means it's going to cause the building to have the overturning effect, but without causing axial forces in the columns that don't actually exist. Right? Because those moment, again, those moment frame columns, they only have axial force that's caused by loads that are directly tributary to the moment frame, plus, of course, overturning loads caused by like the vertical uplift and push down from the moment. Uh, from the moment frame action, right? So all of the other loads, we don't want to put them right on these columns, but we do want to include them, so we'll make this leaning column. And then that leaning column, we're going to connect it to the main frame using some kind of rigid diaphragm um, behavior, right? So we're going to basically make a constraint in our model. In OpenSeas, we call that equal DOF. When we're doing 2D, we'll use a command called equal DOF where we can basically say the x displacement of this node equals 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 the x displacement of the leaning column node so that they all move together and that represents the effect of a rigid diaphragm like a floor that is rigid that connects all these things together and so we'll have one equal DOF diaphragm constraint for this story, we'll have a separate one for this story, a separate one for this story, a separate one for the top. Or I could implement it also as truss elements here. It's saying you could use rigid truss elements to connect this to this. Then probably you still also have some kind of rigid diaphragm anyway. So I typically just use a rigid diaphragm for the whole floor, including the leaning column. Okay, so that's it. So wow, like that was basically two lectures worth of material, <laughs> two and a half hours. So we covered, um, if we go back to review what we covered, we talked about all of materials and elements and geometric transformations um, in nonlinear models. So we talked about how materials work. How do we take those materials and make them nonlinear? How do we take those nonlinear materials and integrate them into elements, either directly or through sections? And then how do element models work? How do trusses work? How do zero length elements work? And then how do beam column elements work and how do they actually integrate and how do I get from um, being given deformations from the OpenSeas model to being able to then integrate all of the different nonlinear things that are going on in the sections of the force based or displacement based beam column model and give back uh, revised forces to OpenSeas so that it can do the next step of the analysis. And so then in future we're going to have to talk about how does OpenSeas get from one time step to the next and what are all of the different options in the analysis that we need to consider? Um, so that will be following after this lecture. Um, thanks for watching. Please don't forget to fill out the uh, reflection. And uh, we'll see you in another week.